welcome to DeFi by Design, where we talk all things blockchain and cryptocurrency, while striving to educate, empower, and enrich. It's your boy Andy, and welcome back to the DeFi Slate YouTube channel. Smash the like button on this video that really helps us out, and sit back and enjoy the content. Thank you very much. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the DeFi by Design podcast, episode 55 here today, and we are with you from a nice cold daylight savings day out here in North Carolina. And uh, we're actually here today with a fellow that we met at LizCon out in Portugal. Oh, it's been what, three weeks now since Portugal and I missed that place. Um, you know, things have been getting wilder in the markets and we're kind of excited to just sit down kind of with an OG of Ethereum and Nikola from DeFi Saver, talk about the product of DeFi Saver, kind of what, 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 is happening in DeFi right now, um, you know, what the buildings are looking like, how you can automate some of your DeFi strategies um, and kind of, you know, use your collateralized debt positions on Maker or, or um, on, on different protocols to kind of utilize them, um, you know, in the most effective way. We're going to talk about some interesting stuff in the metaverse, maybe some, some DAO stuff and some NFT stuff as well. So we're going to cover quite a bit here today. Um, and yeah, excited to, to talk with Good old Nick from uh, the DeFi Saver Lads. I'm pass it over to Rob, and uh, we'll get right into it. Yo, yo, what's going on, guys? Yeah, I am stoked to be here with uh, Nicola from the DeFi Saver team. Like Andy said, we met him over to Lisbon, and um, it was great. I mean, there was so much energy flowing through the room, and it we kind of hit it off right away. Uh, maybe it was because everyone on the team's name is Nicola, and that was just kind of funny. It's a great conversation starter. Um, but really the, the intention and the mission that you guys are, are fulfilling over at DeFi Saver, I think is, is pretty crucial um, for mass adoption, especially with some bigger players to bring them on board and really automate their DeFi positions, automate their, uh, some of their farming positions and, and really bring uh, a level of comfort and almost convenience to DeFi. Which, which is just not there yet. Um, so I'm really looking forward to exploring some of those automation techniques. And uh, I will let uh, Nicola introduce himself and take it from there. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm actually one of the six Nicolas on the team right now. Um, and I'm like the community manager over here at DeFi Server. I've been with the project ever since we launched back in early 2019, actually. So that's like an OG, like a very old project in terms of DeFi. Um, like like Robbie mentioned, what our mission has been for the most part is providing users in DeFi with liquidation protection services. So that's something I guess we'll talk more on the on the podcast here later on. But that's that's sort of been our mission when we first set out and to create it to DeFi server as an app as a whole. Yeah, and now we only have over collateralized loans in DeFi. Well, at least for for the most part, we've got like some under collateralized coming out with uh, Pendo and Maple Finance and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, right now DeFi has been a madhouse of just debt spiraling and just pretty much just all sorts of crazy games with over collateralized loans. I can only imagine what, what the world starts to look like when we get under collateralized loans and, you know, start to create credit scores within, you know, the ecosystem. I, you know, I'm not sure if you thought, any deep, you know, any further or deeper on that, but it's just, you know, I, I, I just can only wonder. I haven't personally, but I know there are a lot of people like looking into it and trying to build things. You mentioned like a credit score of sorts. I know that, for example, the Gearbox protocol is working on something like this, providing like a credit line that you can use against your collateral that you can then use throughout DeFi elsewhere. That's something that might be interesting and something that we're kind of looking at here at DeFi server as well but yeah I know there's a lot of people looking into under collateralized loans as well so I, I think we'll be seeing a lot of that probably in the next year I guess yeah and some of these automation techniques maybe you can unpack um, a, a few more in addition to the, the liquidation protection my my point on, on kind of how we scale like this this automation um, and and bring more efficiency to the ecosystem is you know, right now, DeFi Saver, and my understanding is it's mostly oriented towards those with self-custody, protecting themselves, kind of a risk management tool that individuals can use. And Andy brings in kind of this, this uh, application that's a little bit later down the, the timeline 
where these automation, these let and, and using the example of uh, a decentralized credit score, you know, that credit score application can use DeFi savers automation as, as a risk management software, where now it's managing risk across this entire ecosystem rather than individuals using automation tools themselves to manage risk. Um, could you explain kind of, you know, any, any more of the applications of um, the automation tools at DeFi Saver and, and kind of how you see them playing into these different applications? I guess we could take it from the start. Like what, what is like a MakerDAO, for example, collateralized debt position for starters? Like the basics are you have ETH, you want to collateralize ETH and borrow against it. You borrow DAI using MakerDAO, and then you can use DAI for whatever you want. Now, what people often do is use that DAI to get more ETH and then leverage it up. That's something that people have been doing at DeFi server for the longest time because we've sort of had the tools to do this since the first day we released. Um, but other than that, you can really use the DAI anywhere. And if you're using DAI, the borrow DAI to like farm yield or, yield or something elsewhere, you might just want to set up liquidation protection. And what that does in its current iteration at DeFi server is that it automatically unwinds your position at a configured or like ratio. So instead of letting you go underwater and get liquidated and suffer like a 13%, I think it is in MakerDAO liquidation penalty, you'd get like a minor service fee for pay to DeFi server and you'll get your assets protected by deleveraging the position. The whole process is done is done trustlessly, non-custodially, and it just protects your ass or assets, let's say. Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking to myself, other, um, yeah, in sure. May, May of this past year, um, or this past like you know six months ago, or whatever, just that day that that I, just, I think it was May 13th. I'm just thinking to myself like, damn, that had been really useful. I think it was May like 17 and it was March 13th last year or something like that. Like last year yeah, we had Black, Black Thursday, Thursday and this yeah. year. Exactly. Yeah. Both of those days were kind of crazy. Yeah, the, so did us. you guys have a, a lot of positions that you saved on those days? We had, yeah. We I think we had like seven or eight hundred positions automated during the May crash this year. And at the point like before the crash, that was I think close to 1.5 billion assets collateralized and automated wow. or protected, however you want to put it. Wow. And is that just on Maker or is that Ave? No, no, that other... was that was on Maker Compound yeah. and Ave. Yeah, we have we currently uh, all... have automation available for yeah for all three protocols. We're currently working on support for reflection and liquidity as well. So I guess that's a bit of a teaser. We hope to yeah. have that out by and... end of the year. And so what's the cost? Like um, somebody go ahead and, you know, says, okay, you know, I've got, uh, you know, hundred K of collateral in Aave. I mean, you know, I borrowed 30, 40, you know, you know, however much amount. And, you know, I would like to uh, put my, put my position on DeFi saver. Like what is the cost for the user? It depends how you look at it. Like there's no cost for specifically like keeping a position automated. So you can just leave it on and have it like, monitor your position that doesn't cost anything per se. It's just being tracked by the system and, and that's all. Uh, the only costs that happen are when there actually ha are like some automated transactions happening. And in terms of that, the costs are twofold so, sort of, because you've got the transaction fees that still have to be paid, which is also charged to the position as well as the minor service fee, which is 0.3% right now for any automated transactions happening. But the problem is like we're currently only live on Ethereum L1 and transaction fees are um, very frequently higher than that service fee. So that's that's kind of a pain point for our user right now. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, that's that's the summary of fees. I, I think that's that's about it. Yeah, and on another like user experience question, how, how customizable are these uh, strategies or these tools? Um, and like I'm, what I'm getting at is, is kind of like a parameter where maybe we can adjust slippage and, you know, as DeFi Saver is unwinding our position, it's only doing so at a certain slippage tolerance. So slippage, slippage limits are there in place. Like I believe like default slippage limits of DeFi Saver are 0 0.5 or something like that percent. Uh, but outside of that, we don't really have much configurability right now. That's sort of because we try to keep everything like fully trustless, everything set up on chain. Uh, 
um, but we are working on a bunch of updates in terms of automation. Um, right now, you can only set up like automated liquidation protection or or automated leveraging, which works when markets move down or up. Uh, but what we're what we're working on, like in addition to these options, are features that will allow users to like configure transactions to happen only on below certain gas prices, for example, um, as well as the options to fully close positions instead of having them being unwind, unwound repeatedly, like during market crashes. Um, so that would be like a full stop loss kind of option as well as a yeah. take profit option on markets moving up. And we are working on like automation features for other other use cases as well. We're we're mostly focused on landing protocols and our our, <clears throat> our core user base, sorry, is those that of people leveraging assets. But we are also trying to get into the liquidity providing space and you might see some options like for Uniswap V3 positions or something like that. Cool. Yeah, I mean there's a lot of the there's a lot of um, liquidation, you know, kind of options in DeFi. I mean, a lot of them come from just being, you know, there's a, a 10%, you know, uh, reward for those who do the liquidating, you know, that's a penalty for those who pay. It's different for, for different assets. You know, obviously you get up to DYDX or something like that, um, you know, any sort of margin trading, it's a bit more hefty um, in terms of liquidations, um, you know, and then you've got this kind of concept of these liquidation bots that are out there running that, you know, have these scripts that um, make sure that these protocols are solvent. Um, do you have any experience with anything like that or, or anybody on the team or, you know, in, if you do, you know, what's been the experience or, um, you know, what, what is your knowledge of those? Well, I can tell you that we don't have any experience in this because running liquidation bots would basically be running, like, like running them against our users, which doesn't make much sense. So we are on the other end of the line and we try to keep like, positions and users above the water, above liquidation levels. Uh, but it, like in terms of liquidation bots, I know that space has grown like incredibly compatible. Like if you've seen like liquidations on on some of these larger market crashes, like during May, that, that's that's been like amazing profits for, for liquidators. But at the same time, they 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 have the same problems like all users do on Ethereum or currently, which is high transaction fees. So you can also find like a bunch of small positions. Like if there's somebody who left a tiny bit of assets from like two years ago, for example, if I deposit like 30 DAI two years ago into compound and have 15 DAI borrowed or whatever, like a position that's worth so little, that's underwater, like that's, that's remaining underwater. Nobody's going to liquidate that because the transaction fees will far outweigh any profit there. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, that's definitely been one of the biggest um, recurring kind of issues is the is the Ethereum scaling. So, you know, I'm curious what your vision of the Ethereum you know scaling space race kind of is. Um, you know, in some ways, DeFi has been worse on Ethereum um, since 2020 because of this, but also it's be kind of kind of become a lot better as well because there's um, a lot more products and a lot more protocols, and you know, DeFi and Ethereum is kind of like a you know, it's kind of establishing a large kind of security layer for Ethereum block space, uh, which exactly. is really, which is really important. You know, it's kind of like, um, saw some shit post on Twitter. It was like, it's like a pleb barrier now, you know, it's just, you know, sort of, it, yeah, you can yeah. look at it that way. <laughs> it, right. Which is, you know, kind of a, a negative outlook, but, you know, I'm curious what, what your vision of these uh, scaling space races and, you know, how, uh, how you'd like to see protocols, um, including DeFi Saver kind of integrate these without, you know, sacrificing decentralization and the, and the ethos of why you're here. Um, but yeah, what's your vision of scaling and how do you want to fit in there? That's, that's sort of our thing that we are like an Ethereum first team. So we've kind of been stuck with Ethereum, so to say, and it's high transaction fees so far. But these L2s like Optimism, Arbitrum, and even Z ZK Sync are finally here and like, We've, we're seeing adoption growing and protocols gradually launching there. So our vision is to launch everywhere and on each like Ethereum L2 as long there's users there and there's lending protocols there. there as long as there's anything to support there, we'd be more than willing to, to join. 
to join the party there. Um, like in terms of what we expect to see first, I guess launching an Arbitrum and Optimism is likely to happen the first, yeah. Uh, there's actually still no like major planning protocol launched on any of these, but we're kind of hoping to see Aave by the end of the year. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah. It, and then as soon as Aave is there, like we're on it, we'll, we'll be there just just the day after that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it seems the thing like they... with DeFi, sorry, the D, the thing with DeFi server is like we're an app building on other protocols. We're not a protocol per se. We're more like a service, a tool for some advanced options. But in the end, it's all built on these protocols that we need to see launch first. Yeah, is there any any apprehension that you have to going on other EVM compatible chains? Um, the decentralization maxis right here. Yeah, I mean that's that's the thing. Yeah, we've we've been building on Ethereum since 2017. That's when the Decenter team has first started working together, and we've had a bunch of projects built on here on Ethereum. And yeah, the the current transaction fees are a major problem, but it's a stepping stone. It'll be surpassed and sold soon enough, I think. Yeah, I remember at LizCon they were talking about um, the merge coming and. Um, of course, you know, what comes with that, which is obviously very exciting. You know, I'm definitely excited for Arbitrum and Optimism as well. Um, those are, you know, those are the leaders of, of, of scaling. It has been slow, but I mean, Arbitrum's up, it's live. There's, there's plenty of apps there. I'm kind of surprised that um, none of the lending protocols have gone there yet. I mean, it's not just Aave now, you know, there's, there's almost like a, a bunch of lending protocols from Aave to Compound to, to My Finance. Um, you got the forks of each on separate chains, Cream, Geist, you know, those type of protocols. Um, yeah, I mean, Arbitrum's ecosystem is definitely still small. Um, have you have you toyed around on Arbitrum at all yet? I haven't personally, no. I have to admit I haven't. Um, but like I've been with people on the team who have, so I've, I've seen it in action and it works amazingly fast. So it's, it's awesome to see. And transaction yeah. fees are like 10 times lower at least than on Ethereum mill one. And they should grow lower as, as adoption and usage grows. So it's looking good. Yeah, that was one of the most interesting things that I heard from, from one of my conversations at LizCon from uh, Jordy over at the Hermes team was describing how this Merkle chain, as it grows, it becomes more decentralized and cheaper to use. Exactly, especially in zero knowledge, like chains as far as I know, yeah. Yeah, I found that really interesting because it's, mm. it's now putting together a scaling solution that's going to get better over time compared to any EVM scaling solutions, which still have the potential for congestion and, and still exactly, can see gas yeah. prices you know, kind of grow exuberantly, even like what happened with Polygon. Um, exactly. They had to pump up like gas prices to something yeah. noticeably higher, right? Yeah. To 35, where gas before, I mean, you could get, could have got a transaction through. I mean, like, fees are still like cents there, I guess, but right. Yeah. Definitely. The problems definitely repeat themselves on EVM chains. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Roll I mean, what do you think about scaling to like, you know, millions and then eventually billions of users? Um, yeah, I mean, th that, that's when you get to the case of, of, you know, seeing what can actually scale. So I think ZK Sync is something definitely to look at, but it seems like they're kind of where Arbitrum and Optimism were, say, you know, three or four months ago in terms of their development. Do you know, do you have any more info on ZK Sync? I don't have any inside info, sorry. But yeah, what, what you said, I think is true, correct. Like, we're bound to use like Optimism and Arbitrum for now and like, the ZK options like the ultimate solution, but they're a bit further down the line. Yeah, they'll need a bit more development until they're fully public in life. Yeah. And what's interesting about DeFi Saver, this starts to get away from scaling a bit and, and more in in to what DeFi Saver is, is doing on, you know, the automation that you you have now isn't like you said, it's not really a protocol. Maybe it's an application, but it's really like a tool or a service. And it, it's still a wide enough scope that it's not just contained to like this liquidation engine um, or, or like one tool in particular, which to me is very interesting because we've seen, uh, for example, like, like yield compounders, 
um, you know, they, they take um, some LP position from the lend and borrow, and then we'll compound your yield for you, which to me is like an automation tool, but it's a, it's a tool or a service that um, developers have deployed in their own application. Whereas DeFi Saver kind of is open-ended to the amount of applications and the breadth of applications that it can be applied to. So I'm yeah, that's sort of our thing. We've, we've been mostly focused on end users and not that, that going to continue to be our focus like on actual end users like for example you'll see why you're in building like their like you mentioned yield aggregating tools and vaults but then we're a we're an app that will include and support wire and we already have wire and integrated for example so yeah you you have those those kinds of apps that are like middle layer apps and then we're fully like focused on end users and we yeah. we aim to provide like end users with options to set up and create custom automated strategies that's that's kind of the end goal for us yeah are you a believer of the um fat protocol thesis where you guys are as a as a money lego almost on like the on like the if ethereum's the island and we're building on top you guys are like in like the higher level of the castle and down under you've got like stable coins you know, you've got all all the money legos you know, as we've gone over, you guys are kind of like a service for protocol. So I almost consider you guys to be like outerware if Ave is like the middleware or like the, or like a Lego you guys are built, you know, on top, right? And it keeps going. Um, you know, do you believe that all that value is, is, you know, accrued to Ethereum? And then also, you know, with these other layer ones happening right now and their valuations, like, like um, Solana, Avalanche, and Phantom, Harmony, all of them have surged in market cap recently because of probably people believing in, in this thesis, um, but you know, specifically for Ethereum, is that kind of how you view apps on you know, accruing value to Ethereum? Or do you have a different you know, m way of uh, addressing the value of the Ethereum network? Um, you know, or, is it, or do you align with the FAT protocol thesis? I think I agree with the fat protocol thesis. Yeah, what you said mostly makes sense to me, so I'd agree. But then, in terms like of the sorry of the of the value on other chains, like constantly growing, like I I'd like to consider that it's partially due to a bunch of like yield farming options and like in liquidity incentives launching there. So people follow that kind of stuff. So it's it's bound to. To show growth, see to show growth. Sorry for for any like chain that introduces such such options. But at the same time, like people need places to to try these things out as well. Like there's no way for me to onboard like friends and family to to Ethereum L1 like right now. That's that's just not doable at these transaction fees. So yeah, if I'm going to like educate someone on how to use DeFi and or EVM chains in general. I'm going to do it on Polygon or something like that, of course. Uh, but uh, in the end, does it all pour down back to into Ethereum? I think it will. But yeah. you can also call me an ETH Maxi. So. But that's even like a bigger question. Not even is it just the money Legos built on Ethereum, but all of the other chains that are EVM compatible that also have their own money Legos. You could argue that not only does all that value accrue um, to the to the respective chains, but but Avalanche, Phantom, Harmony, Polygon, all of those chains value also accrue to Ethereum. So you can take all the market caps of them and consider that value, all of that monetary basically structure and liquidity is basically Ethereum's, if you want to think about it like that. And yeah, I mean, then when you combine that with- Well, I haven't, I haven't like kept track of how much of the assets deployed on other chains are bridged from Ethereum there. Like that'd be an interesting like metric to check, I, I guess. So that, yeah. that will potentially confirm what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's kind of like the hub and spoke model that we we've we've you know we talked about that on on DeFi by design quite a bit. Just you know the the country model where you've got you know like a home base and then you've got you know hub and spoke model for um, with regards to other places. And I think you know Arbitrum and Optimism and um, other layer twos they might be like closer, if you will, to the mainland, but they are also in them of themselves, um, you know, part of the part of the hub and spoke model. But it's just really interesting to see how pricing of block space um, shows security and kind of like legitimacy. Um, you know, it's tough to say with fees generated, um, you know, but that's, 
just kind of how it is, you know, it's, it, it, yeah. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see how in, you know, two, three years, what, if, if Ethereum is, is going to be, you know, as expensive or more expensive or less and what that, you know, what that kind of world looks like in the multi-chain world. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely yeah, excited that, for it. That's something I wanted to add. Perhaps the future is, perhaps it's multi-chain, like who knows? Like I, I'll just, I like to highlight, I'm not a developer personally, so this might be a bit over my head, but we'll see, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Andy, as you were describing again, the money Lego mental model um, and kind of along with the hub and spoke, I see, you know, potential for horizontal integration and vertical integration. We have Ethereum that is kind of like the hub with, with spokes out to these other kind of perimeter layer ones. And then you can kind of build on top of those spokes, um, you know, with different applications and, and then applications can stack on top of one another. And where I see DeFi Saver kind of inserting themselves into that mix is almost with uh, like fluidity between these applications. You know, if you think about like the money Legos, not necessarily composability between these exchanges and these different applications, but kind of like glue that holds these Legos together um, left to right rather than up to down, because of course, you know, they can stack easily with, with, with smart contracts, but the tools to interact application to application, you know, that's almost what DeFi Saver is automating and, and bringing more efficiency to. That's something that might become very interesting, like in the coming months, actually, because there'll be a lot of interoperability works between like L2 chains, I think. So it might become quite interesting. Yeah. 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 And, and I think the, is, the product will hit hard on, on arbitrum and optimism. There's no reason to not use something like that um, on a in in a low fee environment. Exactly. Yeah. Is there any any plans to start building out interoperability between applications? Because, like you mentioned, right now it's mostly application and user that the automation is in, in interacting between. You know, is there anything application to application in the works? Uh, not specifically. Not that I know of. Yeah. Cool. I, w I wonder how that would look, um, you know, basically being able to operate as if you could, you could manage positions. Like I'm wondering if you could manage positions across, um, you know, is there a way to provide liquidity to be a position manager? Like um, where, how does the, uh, how is the debt paid back on certain positions? Or how is the collateral added, and how are that? How is that liquidity being benefited? Benefited by whom? Sorry. Yeah. So, in the instance that there's a position that is going to be underwater, okay. where is the where does the collateral come from to add or to pay back some of the debt? And then how does exactly that... from the? Sorry. Yeah. Do finish. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. And then basically, how is that? You know. I don't think I'm understanding um, where the collateral is coming from properly because the way that I'm I'm looking at it is like okay if I'm going to be helping out um, these users I'm going to earn some sort of yield from this um, and, and my and my collateral could be used um, to you know to pay back and that's my opportunity cost um, is paying the yield but I think you were get, you were getting to that the uh, position is actually paid back by the same user. Yeah, exactly. It's actually paid back the debt is paid back by the position itself. It gets unwound. Uh, the debt is actually paid back by the collateral. A bit of the collateral gets sold to pay back the part of the debt. It sits, the position is over collateralized. That small bit of collateral pays back a larger like percentage of the loan. So the ratio goes up, the position is safe again, and it's all good for until the next drop in price happens, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but then in terms of what you mentioned, like some similar options to that, yeah, we'd like to like provide a bunch of other options. For example, one thing people have been asking for the longest time is like having the automated option to pay back their debt with the assets that have been deployed to a different protocol. So that's something that we'd like to, to add and support in the coming months as well. For example, if you borrowed like, again, die and deploy that into wire into your year and to earn some yield there um it would be awesome to have the option to pay back that with that die from wire and instead yeah. of selling your ETH to to cover the debt so that's pull it out and then use it like. yeah exactly yeah that'd just, be really cool 
Yeah. That'd be really cool. Um, I had a random question for you, Nicola. Um, how many uh, sure. ENS names do you own? Um, I think I actually currently own three, I think. It was four until recently. Nice. Yeah, what's the day 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 drop? Is it like in, <laughs> like four or five hours or something? Yeah, I think it's in five hours. What do you think? Yeah. Is ENS going to be absolutely massive as like the domain or the like the web two? Um, you know, if you bought Chuck E. Cheese dot com or, um, you know, I love food dot com or or crypto dot com, you know, is is something like LOL dot ETH or um, or Vitalik dot ETH? Is that worth, you know, hundreds of ETH or is it kind of is it the same? You know, is that digital real estate in Web3? ENS is quite, quite interesting. I love ENS. Uh, I think we've already seen like things like that happen. I think it was Budweiser, like the American Budweiser that bought beer.eth for like a couple, a couple hundred ETH or something. It was a bunch of money, I think. Uh, but yeah, but I think we're already seeing like ENS becoming like the dominant domain name service on Ethereum. And like, will they stay on top? I I guess so. It looks so right now. I'm, I mean, the, any competition they had so far has been beaten, I guess. Um, yeah, I haven't seen any competition. Yeah, for, for I mean, there's unstoppable, unstoppable there's domains, huge. but they're a bit behind. Yeah, you can buy dot um, dot Bitcoin um, dot you know other things there as well. But yeah, as far as yeah, culture yeah. goes, I mean, ENS has won just by, just by Twitter. Exactly. And the adoption you see on Twitter, like from yeah. real famous people, it's, it's getting out of hand, really. So it's really cool to see. Like, you're going to hodl this airdrop, aren't you? You're in, no way you're selling it. Yeah, I think I'm, I am. I'm going to hold it. Yeah. Yeah, same here. <laughs> I was thinking this morning, like Facebook.eth has got to be a stellar buy. Yeah. Or, like, yeah. Is Zuckerberg going to come in and pay a few hundred ETH for Facebook.eth? Wait, he needs Meta, Meta.eth right now, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just such a powerful way to, to have a public address that is connected to your wallet. That's so easy. Like, that is, that is so much better than Ethereum addresses. Like, and I think that that's something that could be as big as so it's even bigger than I think that we can imagine because it's such a problem for newbies and for even us still, man, people who use ETH all the time, like having to copy and paste addresses in, instead of just having, instead of being able to just write like, oh, to DeFi Slate or to, you know, Andy.eth or something, it's, 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 it's nuts. It's massive. And that's not like even the best, I think, use case. Like, I really like using Ethereum accounts, like global web accounts. That's something that I think has a big future. What like do you mean? signing in, like logging in into like any web, web services with your Ethereum account instead of having to like create a new account with your email. That's that's something yeah. I'm really looking like, forward to. Like authentication where you exactly. can just click yeah. sign up with Ethereum rather than sign up with Apple or sign up with Facebook or exactly. You know, yeah. Yeah. I'd like to see that happen. Yeah. Interesting. So and, ENS did a really good airdrop where they brought, you know, they did like a time-based and by how many domain names you own. And they made sure that, that if you were squatting on hundreds, that you, you had to be active and that they had to have a certain I amount of I think I see where this is going, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious, going. like for all of our DeFi savers out there, you know, <laughs> you know, what are you thinking about these DeFi savers out there? How has the team thought about this? You know, what are your personal thoughts? Um, like in terms of airdrop hunting, like the DeFi saver drop, right? Was that the question actually? <laughs> uh, this phenomenon of airdrop hunting has become quite interesting let's put it that way um, I think people are going way out of their way to run perhaps pointless transactions and waste ETH needlessly on transactions that perhaps don't have much sense in terms of what any certain like app is meant to be used for and we're seeing like a bunch of random transactions happening, like a deep base error, which are, I'm guessing, pretty obviously because of people trying to really hunt an airdrop. Yeah, you'd see like people swapping like 0 0.001 ETH for like 
two die and stuff like that that transaction fees that are in hundreds of dollars that i don't think that makes sense to do and but in terms like what the actual like rules of an airdrop would be i have no idea like it's it's not happening at least not so far i've I've got no inside input sorry no leaks no teasers no nothing so it, it really hasn't been discussed as the focus is kind of on product first and and i, I mean, assume you're a believer of that model product then token yeah we definitely that, are or, like or something never like token. i mean i don't know maybe maybe yeah. never but maybe sometime but yeah we we like to get the product like polished very nicely and then think of the next steps like for example what the idx did i think that's that's amazing like the their l2 pro product is it, it works so so amazingly well and that's the point where you, when you go out and say okay now now's the time to like fully decentralize and get governance in and figure out a token and set some token economics up and everything that's that's one project i really admire um, I don't think we're currently there just yet. I mean, has the token ever been talked about internally? Of course it has, but has it been considered? Not just yet. Um, but it's very interesting. Like we've come, like we've started working at a time, like working on DeFi server at a time when token, tokens were like considered like a very bad thing. Like if project was launching a token, it was, if you don't want to, play with this thing like it's probably going to just you know, dump on you and just disappear forever in, in like three weeks or something that's the bear market vibes yeah it, <laughs> it is yeah 2017 um, everything's a utility token things have tra- changed quite a bit nowadays though i mean we obviously you know, are still going to keep seeing stuff like that happen but uh like sharing the value value accrual of a certain platform with its users early adopters and everyone that's something that's that's awesome the the, the way that ethereum and these token tokens enable this that, that's amazing and is this something we'd like to see happen with DeFi server as well i mean cer- certainly but there, yeah. there's just no plans for that just yet We've heard like a few different projects mention, you know, sufficient decentralization as that that barrier um, or really that threshold to meet before going and investigating a token and, you know, potentially using that in their protocol for for some instance. What does that look like to you? I guess maybe from a general perspective, and then, you know, on on DeFi Saber specifically, what what does sufficient decentralization mean to you? Oh, I, I think that's quite a difficult question to answer, actually, um, because decentralization really has, is a spectrum. There's, there's no other way to put it, I guess. Um, in terms of DeFi saver, hmm, when, when's the point we can say that? I think it's the point where we're sufficiently like um, satisfied with all the features available in the product. We are uh happy with everything that's put together there's a then we've also prepared ways to, for other people to permissionlessly add support for additional protocols and we also need to figure out like a way for people to run their own like automation bots and things like that that's the point where DeFi server can become like sufficiently decentralized i think how long away that is right now really not sure because we've got a quite a lot of things to figure out in terms of the features we want to provide for now and yeah yeah (laughs) yeah i mean it's definitely a spectrum and it's it's a matter of kind of where you know when you when the team is is ready but it's 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 more so um you know, as you say, that mindset of kind of launching a token as a negative, um, it's an interesting one. And, and there's legal and, and there's, you know, there's there's concepts of, of DAOs and, um, you know, there's a lot of things that, that go into it. it. It's kind of interesting that you mentioned building in that time. Um, you know, I would love to just take like a minute or two and just talk real briefly about that time that you guys were in, because frankly, we didn't come along in DeFi space. I mean, we've been in crypto since like 2017, but kind of took a break in the bear market um 
you know, of course, right? And came back in early 2020 and found DeFi. Good for you. Right. But whereas you guys were building DeFi all along with, you know, synthetics and the Ave guys, and eventually Compound started their first yield farming ever. So what was it like in, you know, mid 2019 building DeFi? Like what was the Ethereum community like, you know, and what was DeFi like? It was quite a bit different, but uh, for example, like at the time when we started, like in, I think we launched like the first mainnet release in April, 2019. And at that point there was MakerDAO and there was Compound and Compound launched in December. I think that was Compound V1 at that point. So like the, the ecosystem at that point was quite a bit different. Um, thing was, things were quite a bit slower. And that was the case, like for multiple reasons. Firstly, there were there was not like that many protocols. Nowadays, we see like new protocol launch every day, potentially, especially given how much chains we have you know, like that are active right now. Uh, but at the same time, there weren't that many users. Like MakerDAO at that point, like maybe had fifty million DAI in circulation or hundred million DAI in circulation compared to eight billion today. So that's that's a completely different space. To, like back then, there was like I think it was literally like hundreds of DeFi users at that point. So it was. Hmm, I'd like to say it was nice, but that's just because it was slower. Nowadays, it's really hard to keep up with everything, especially when you work in DeFi, because you've got a lot of stuff to handle on your end, and then you have to keep up with everything that's happening outside. It gets pretty wild. Uh, but it's definitely nicer nowadays because there's so much more happening. There's so much new things like being built that simply weren't there. That's maybe even being figured out for the first time in economics. It's it's amazing, really. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it's super cool seeing um, kind of like a lot of different breakout points show themselves now, whereas in 2017, I mean, they were almost... A lot of them were only ideas and, and a lot of them ha hadn't even been thought about yet or discovered. Um, and I mean, like we had like MakerDAO was there in 2017. It just wasn't, I think they actually even launched the earliest version in late 2017 or something. I can't, can't quite remember. There was no Uniswap. There was, there was no Uniswap, definitely no. Yeah. There was ETH Land, for example. That was the, the Ave before Ave. Um, yeah. There were things happening, but... It was taking taking a while to get where we are now. But to, to just look back at it and, and like we had two protocols in 2019 and to just see how, how much stuff we have today, that's in two years. That's amazing. That's yeah, it's interesting getting a little bit back to that fat protocol thesis, how when the protocols were around, there didn't seem to be much use case, right? Because that application layer hadn't been developed yet. So it was like, well, what are we going to use MakerDAO for? Why do I even want an over collateralized loan? Um, mm. But now after seeing the use cases, seeing the applications, like you can really, you can really understand the, uh, the foresight from like the MakerDAO team and these early protocols to see like, okay, you know, these are the applications that we're building for, um, and, and then it was really just about the primitives that, that started to unravel as a result of the protocols and the applications and then starting to combine like these different Legos. It's very cool. Nuts. Yeah. Absolutely insane. Um, what do you guys have coming up, Nick, for uh, upcoming releases, updates? You know, what can the DeFi saver community get excited about um, as we kind of wrap this up? I guess we partially touched on it already but like the major things we have coming up in the coming months is l2 support and more automation options like that those are the things we're betting on like hugely um and those will be like the two major things for us to to roll out but other than that we like constantly push out user face user interface sorry updates and tweaks and just last week we launched like a new portfolio page that's quite a bit nicer than the old one has support for a bunch of additional protocols uh this week we're working on allowing users to batch like a number of different actions in any of the protocols we have supported we're like constantly trying to like optimize and get 
the most out of the interface and to enable like users to just do the most that they can like make them power users provide them with the power tools for DeFi. sweet that's awesome yeah um can can we find you on discord twitter and Telegram? absolutely awesome. absolutely you can find me on twitter and you can find me in the DeFi server discord 24 7 so hop in and i'll see you there amazing well thanks thanks for coming on nick and chatting about all things DeFi. DeFi thank saver. you guys for having me yes sir it's a pleasure <laughs> likewise thanks, nick.